Spring Boot is a popular framework for building Java-based web applications and microservices. It's designed to make it easy to create standalone, production-grade ready applications that just run. In this video, we'll discuss 10 tips to help you get productive right away with Spring Boot. Let's get started. Coming in at number 10, don't create, generate. Use the Spring Initializer to generate a starting point for your project. Spring Initializer is a tool that allows you to choose the dependencies for your project and generate a skeleton application that works right out of the box. Spring Initializer exists in many forms, including the web-based version we see here, a command line version, and it's built into many great IDEs like IntelliJ, as we'll see in just a moment. With Initializer, we can select our build system, the JVM language we'll use, and specify the package and artifact name we'll use in the code generated for our starter application. There are dozens of different dependencies to choose from when we create a project, and the initializer makes it easy to select just the ones we want, so we can configure our build system to include everything we need to get going. IntelliJ Ultimate includes Spring Initializer as one of the choices when creating a project. It gives us access to all the same options to specify what we want when we're creating our application, as well as a convenient way to search for and add the dependencies we need to create our project. Coming in at number nine, Use the latest features, or don't. Spring Boot 3 is built on and requires the Spring Framework version 6. If you're starting a project from scratch and can choose, using the latest version is the best way to go. You'll have a longer runway for support, you'll minimize the number of security findings, and you'll have all the latest features to take advantage of. But like anything else, all this power comes at a price. Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3 require Java 17 at a minimum. If you're currently on one of the earlier, long-term support versions of Java, like version 8 or 11, you'll need to upgrade. Depending on your project, how it's deployed, your company policies, and the controls in place in your organization, moving to a new version of Java could be a huge undertaking. At the very least, you'll want to do extensive integration testing to make sure everything still works. A few other changes to be aware of. The Java X namespace was migrated to Jakarta in Spring Framework 6 for servlets, JPA, the Java Persistence API, as well as other APIs. For example, if your old code used an import statement like javax.servlet.httpservlet.request, that's the old Java EE way and is no longer supported in Spring 6. The new namespace is jakarta.servlet.httpservlet.request, which supports Jakarta EE9. You might think this won't impact you, and you might be right, but don't forget about any external libraries your existing applications may use or depend on, and if the changes will impact them. Other tools will require upgrades to their versions, including Kotlin, Gradle, and others. Keep in mind if you're using an older version of Spring and it works, you might want to just stick with it. The older version may not give you access to all the latest bills and whistles, but it will keep your project functioning. Migration to a new version is certainly possible, but it requires careful planning. Next up, number eight, your project structure should follow best practices. A typical Spring Boot project uses a common layout when arranging the source files, configuration files, and other content. This makes it easy to know where to look for things when you need them. It also allows you to take advantage of some of the default behavior Spring provides, such as component scanning and auto configuration. In our simple example shown here, our project structure is based on what we would see in any Maven project. Under our project name, we have the project structure, source, main, Java, as the root of our source code. Our internal application package structure follows from there. Similarly, our test code lives under source, test, Java. Any test we write should mirror the package structure of our application source code just to keep things neat and organized. Spring takes things a step further and adds a directory under source, main, resources, which becomes the root of configuration including static files for new web content, such as CSS files, JavaScript code, HTML files, etc. And the templates directory will contain any dynamic web pages we may create, for example, with TimeLeaf. The application configuration file, application.properties, is under resources too, and it's where we should manage all of our application configuration, as well as configuring overrides for default behavior. So how do we keep the application files we create organized? A very simple but effective approach is shown here. At the same point in our hierarchy, where our entry point application lives, we can create root level directories for all the things we need. For example, controller, DTO, 
exception, model, security, and so on. Of course, these directories are only starting points themselves and can contain subfolders as needed to manage the source code as our application grows. Next up, number seven, use auto configuration to get started quickly. The auto configuration feature in Spring Boot attempts to configure your Spring application automatically based on your dependencies. Let's say you have an H2 database specified in your class path and it's not yet configured. Spring Boot will auto configure an in memory database for you. It will connect you to the database using the SA account by default with no password. Certainly, this isn't secure, but it gets you up and running right away. Use the Add Spring Boot application annotation to enable auto configuration. This annotation is a convenience annotation that combines three other annotations at configuration, at enable auto configuration, and at component scan. The configuration annotation indicates there will be bean definitions declared and that they should be processed. Enable auto configuration, like the name says, will enable auto configuration. Component scan, without arguments, tells Spring to scan the current package and all its subpackages for components. Auto configuration will get you up and running right away. As your application evolves, you'll make decisions to disable or change configuration items. Updating these items on your own configuration will override any auto configuration settings. Sometimes auto configuration can seem like magic and it may not always be clear what the current setting of an item is. You can find out the current auto configuration settings of your application by starting it with the dash dash debug switch on the command line. Next up, number six, configure don't hard code. Use the application properties or application.yaml file to configure your application. Spring Boot uses the application.properties or YAML file to configure various aspects of the application, such as the database connection details, server port, and so on. Use the settings in these files to override the default configuration, change the behavior to meet the needs of your application, or comply with the policies of your organization. Manage any custom application configuration settings in these files too. Never hard code configuration settings, which makes your application brittle and difficult to change. Use these files to manage the settings of any additional jars that you may use in your application, should you need functionality beyond what the Spring Boot and Spring Frameworks provide. Should you need to override configuration settings at runtime, command line switches can be used to override the settings in the application properties or YAML file. This may make sense, for example, when injecting credentials or other secrets into your application when you deploy it in production. There are quite literally hundreds of possible configuration settings that Spring makes available to us to tweak and tune our applications. Everything from database configuration to configuring a web application to security is available to us to modify. Our next item is use profiles. Spring Boot allows you to define different profiles for your application and activate a specified profile using the spring.profile.active property. With Spring Profiles, you can isolate parts of your application configuration and make them available only in certain environments. This can be useful for running different configurations for different environments like development, staging, or production. Using an annotation like at profile, you can specify different application behavior for local, dev, test, performance, and production environments. The component or configuration annotations can be marked with profile annotations to restrict when they're loaded to only certain environments or situations. In addition, Spring Profiles can be defined in YAML files to change the configuration used based on the specified environment the application is deployed in. As with most things in Spring, profiles can be overridden using command line switches. Coming in at number four is Know Your Entry Point. Know Your Entry Point, so what does that mean? It's not always easy to determine the entry point into a Spring application, especially a large, complex application that you didn't write. So here are a few tips on how to find the starting point in an application that, congratulations, you're now responsible for the maintenance and continued development of. Search the code for a class with the Add Spring Boot Application annotation. It's a very likely candidate for the class with the main method that drives the application, but it's not always used, so you may need to keep looking. Next, search for the Spring Application.run method invocation. This method is generally the entry point in your Spring Boot application and where your application launches from. But if that's not found either, and when all else fails, if your application is launched from a jar, crack open that jar and look in the manifest.mf file in the meta-inf directory. 
the attribute start class should have the name of the class file used to start up your application. All right, we're getting close. Now we're at number three, use Spring Boot starters. Spring Boot starter dependencies include common functionality for your application. Starters are a set of convenient dependencies that can be included in your project to enable common functionality such as web development, security, and data access. Using them saves time and trouble since you don't have to hunt down the functionality you need in other libraries and end up with compatibility issues when you try to make everything work. Managing dependencies is a critical aspect in any complex project. The more time you spend on this, the less time you have to devote to other aspects of the project, like coding and testing. This is why Spring Boot starters were built. You can add starter POMs to your application to describe your dependencies. There are more than 30 boot starters you can choose from. Let's take a quick look at what's available. There are starters for common tasks like caching to improve application performance, JPA, one of the many ways available for managing your persistence layer, Timeleaf for creating web applications, and many, many more. Next up, our number two item, which is use Spring Boot DevTools for faster development. The Spring Boot DevTools dependency enables automatic restart of the application when code changes are detected. This can greatly speed up the development process. Using DevTools, your application will restart when files in the class path change, so you can see the results right away without the need to start and stop things yourself. There's nothing more frustrating and time-wasting than making a change, forgetting to restart, and then not seeing the change that you made reflected in your code. Not every change will cause a restart, including changes made to slash resources, static, public, and a few others. But you can set things so changes to a particular file that you specify will trigger a restart to your application. Another great feature of DevTools is Live Reload, which triggers a browser refresh when resources change. Again, to keep you from driving yourself crazy when you make a change to your code, but you don't see it reflected when your application runs. These features are great for local development on your workstation and can also be used to perform restarts on remote servers, which might be necessary depending on how your team writes and tests code. However, this is something you most definitely do not want to deploy into production due to security risks and the performance hit that you take by using this feature. Finally, the number one tip for getting started with Spring Boot is use the Spring Boot Maven plugin. The Maven plugin provides support for Apache Maven and allows you to package your application as an executable jar or war, run Spring Boot applications, and generate build information prior to running integration tests. The plugin provides sensible default behavior and settings such as UTF character encoding, resource filtering so you only package up what you need in your application, even more resource filtering for the appropriate application.properties or YAML file that you need. The Spring Boot Maven plugin can be used to package your application as an executable jar, which can be run with the java-jar command. This makes it easy to deploy your application to other servers or environments. So what if you prefer Gradle? There's a Spring Boot Gradle plugin as well, and in many cases, a Gradle build will run even faster than a Maven build, so by all means, give it a try. All right, that's it. If you use some or all of these tips, you should be well on your way to building successful Spring Boot applications. If you found this video useful, please subscribe to help the channel grow and to be alerted when new content's released. And remember to always begin secure.